Now, I'm excited to introduce our host, Dr. Joanna Gardner Huggett, who is an Associate Dean and Associate Professor of History of Art and Architecture at DePaul University. She teaches courses on 20th century art and feminist theory, while her research focuses on the intersection between feminist collaboration and art activism and has been published in numerous journals and anthologies. Joanna's most recent scholarship explores the history of the Chicago-based women artists collectives, Artesmia Gallery in Chicago, ARC Gallery, and Sapphire and Crystal. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Joanna. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I want to thank uh, Harolyn for the kind introduction and to Effie um, for handling the tech this evening. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, how do I? Oh, what's happening here? Oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. And I am going to um, give this presentation and at the end there'll be time, certainly time for questions and comments and I'm always uh, happy to take feedback from everyone. So tonight I'm going to explore the history of feminist and activist art in Chicago from the 1970s through the present, specifically through the work of three women collectives and Harland named some of them already. Artemisia Gallery, founded in 1973 and closed in 2003. Woman Made Gallery, founded in 1992, and Sapphire and Crystals, founded in 1987. All three were established to promote and expand the visibility of female identifying artists in Chicago and beyond. Before delving into the specific histories of Artemisia, Woman Made, and Sapphire and Crystals, I want to define what I mean by feminist activist art. So one, organizations whose primary intent is activist rather than artistic, but which draw upon feminist art practices. And second, art that feminists have engaged with as activists and artworks where the very process of making and or distributing the work has been intended as something that will intervene to make a discernible difference in people's lives, that will transgress current laws or social practices, or that will rally protests beyond the art world. And these are two definitions framed by Lucinda Gosling, Hilary Robinson, and Amy Tobin. And I'm going to use these two points to talk about the history of each collective briefly and feature one activist project that they have produced over time. So I'm going to explore how the organizations function as activists, modifying the first definition to include artist organizations that use activist modes to support the arts and how they've employed that in an activist manner, as I noted. But I'm also going to stress the challenges faced when implementing and sustaining activist projects. So briefly, I want to stress that Chicago was a better city for women artists than most. For example, in the 1970s, when Artemisia was founded, 29% of commercial galleries gave solo exhibitions to female artists in 1973, in contrast to 9% in New York and 0% in Los Angeles that same year. Of course, it's important to note that the women shown were primarily white, Black and Indigenous women of color historically are marginalized and experience much higher rates of erasure, as we will discuss with the Black women artists collective Sapphire and Crystals. In Chicago, women artists cooperatives emerged in parallel with feminist activist organizations. For example, the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, the West Side Group, and Women's Radical Action Project demanded equal treatment for women in the workplace, affordable and accessible child and health care, and the right to control one's own body. And here you see a poster for the Chicago Women, women Liberation Union's Liberation School. Like the women artist collectives we will discuss, the school was separatist, provided practical skills for women, as well as theory. 
Inexpensive courses range from car repair to women in American literature and provided babysitting so women did not have obstacles to education. And on a national level, the political campaign staged by the National Organization for Women, founded in 1966, and the Supreme Court's landmark decision to strike down many state abortion laws with Roe versus Wade in January 1973 also signaled to women that the promise of protest against the politics of exclusion was real. Now, Artemisia opened in September 1973 alongside a second women's artist cooperative, ARC Gallery, which is still open today. They opened in the heart of the Commercial Gallery District in Chicago and very close to the original site of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago on Ontario Street. It's now closer to um, Michigan Avenue at, between Pearson and Chicago. And they wanted to be at the heart of artistic discourse. Both Artemisia and ARC modeled themselves on AIR Gallery New York, or Artists and Residents, which opened in 1972. And you see them here at a meeting that same year, or two years later. And their model was focusing on female membership with 10 to 20 members at any one time. They regularly met to share their work and hold group critiques, and they established a non-hierarchical mode of governance where decisions are, were con consensus-based and everyone shares in all aspects of running of the day-to-day -day requirements of the gallery. The membership of Artemisia agreed that they wanted to name the space after a woman artist from history and decided on Artemisia Gentileschi, whose best work had been credited to her father, Orazio. And you see her famous painting, Judith Beheading Holofernes on the right. Artemisia Gentileschi was particularly appealing as one of the few women artists known in the early 70s and for her history of surviving rape by her tutor, Agostino Tassi and succeeding despite it. As the Chicago critic Franz Schultz argues, the adoption of Artemisia as their name and role model revealed their strong feminist stance. So in addition to monthly membership dues, members were required to run all aspects of the gallery, from gallery sitting to cleaning toilets, but membership did guarantee an annual solo exhibition for each artist in the collective. And here you see them gathering to do their first mailing for the, for the um, space. This translated into learning significant skills, whether installing exhibitions, carpentry, publicity, grant writing, and collaborating with other groups, which could be taken out of the cooperative and used to infiltrate more mainstream institutions. And indeed, many women gained employment from this training. In this instance, Artemisia members renovated a brand new gallery space in 1976, for many, this was the first time that they had engaged in any real construction work. Artemisia extended its concept of community from its own organizational structure by sponsoring public workshops, panels, and lectures by visiting artists through its education branch, the Artemisia Fund. For instance, the artist Judy Chicago, shown on the left, seated on the floor by the wall, exhibited and visited in 1974 just as she was starting the now canonical dinner party installation on the right, which is now in the Brooklyn Museum. This gave members in the wider arts community up close and direct access to major players in the feminist art movement, which was not being taught in art schools or featured in museums in Chicago. In 1985, Artemisia embarked on an ambitious public art project called Critical Messages, with an activist goal to prompt a dialogue across a range of Chicago communities. The principal curators, Artemisia members Anita David and Nicole Ferentz, and White Walls editor Buzz Spector envisioned an exhibition that engaged the public and circulated well beyond the confines of the gallery. It was time to coincide with the International Art Expo held each May in Chicago and was intended to demonstrate that alternative spaces could effectively support political art without being compromised by the consumer market. And here you're looking at a portion of the broadsheet published to accompany the exhibit. Critical Messages, the Use of Public Media Art for Women highlighted the work of 57 women artists in three different venues in Chicago. 
Artists created posters for the Chicago Transit Authority or CTA's elevated trains and buses. The Cultural Center mounted an artist book exhibition and public television's image union on WTTW screened video works. By, 1980, by May 1984, David and Ference had secured permission from the CTA to install critical messages on buses and trains, along with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Illinois Arts Council and City Arts Tube Challenge Grant. The curators began recruiting artists and the list boasts now very famous figures engaged in media-based art from the early 1980s, such as Alona Granit, Jenny Holzer, Barbara Kruger, and Kay Rosen. And if some of you may have seen Barbara Kruger's, uh, you invest in the divinity of the masterpiece if you saw her retrospective recently at the Art Institute of Chicago. These artists not only shared an understanding of how media represented gender, but also hijacked its modes of circulation to broadcast their own messages and subvert centralized and syndicated communications. And some critics just called it rant art. David and Ference agreed to submit a mock-up of each placard or poster to the CTA for final approval. According to correspondence between the curators and the CTA, the only types of content deemed not acceptable were nudity, profanity, or support of a political candidate. Slowly, they began to receive phone calls from the CTA, informing Artemisia that a particular piece would not run. David and Ference petitioned the CTA, stating that none of the artists violated CTA guidelines, but the agency simply responded that their contract reserved the right to reject any ads. Artemisia's lawyer, Jonah J. Orlovsky, received a letter from the CTA outlining the agency's objections to 10 of the placards only after several weeks of persistent requests for documentation and only two weeks before critical messages was to open. The CTA lawyer, Tom W. Stone Cipher, replied, that the agency's primary function is to move large numbers of captive riders quickly and inexpensively in an environment which will not disturb or disrupt them and which respects them and which respects the fact that they are all already a captive audience. To accomplish this objective, the CTA has consistently not accepted advertisements which are or which experience shows would be vulgar, shocking, misleading, controversial, or otherwise disruptive of CTA leadership. Nowhere were nudity, profanity, or support of a political candidate mentioned as criteria for refusal. So with the public art component of critical messages now cut more than half, the curators decided to exhibit the rejected placards at Artemisia in conjunction with the correspondence between the gallery and the CAA and CTA. The rejected images that did not ride rails or buses took on questions of misogyny, war, the industrial military industrial complex, nuclear proliferation, and President Ronald Reagan. And I'm just gonna show a few examples. Barbara Jo Revelle's photographs of four different white men juxtaposed with four panels of text with responses to the question, how do you look at women? Such as, I look at them from the bottom up was rejected because it is vulgar, immoral and demeaning to women. What was clear is that the CTA did not understand that these works were intended to prompt a critique and dialogue of these societal issues, not an affirmation. Esther Parada contributed a poster depicting Smedley Butler under the title of Who Was Smedley Butler? A United States Marine Corps general, he is flanked by two questions on the left. One of the really great generals in American history, and on the right, a racketeer for capitalism. Viewers then evaluate General Douglas MacArthur's glowing evaluation of Butler versus his own assertion that he prepared Latin America for U.S. corporate investment in the 1900s. According to the CTA, it was rejected because it raises controversial public issues concerning Central America and the possible use of American military forces in that area. California-based artist Sheila Pinkle's image of two hands with text 
Fear is our gross national product from her thermonuclear garden series was rejected because it is disruptive, unsettling, misleading. Kruger's poster with a close up black and white photograph of a tooth being extracted with accompanying text, you are a captive audience, just like the CTA's letter, was rejected by the CTA because it was an extreme close up photograph of a tooth being extracted, which is vulgar and offensive. Jan Ballard's poster was the only one to reference a politician directly. It features a television still of President Reagan on the left framed by two smaller images. Two people cast in shadow, talking, and a woman consuming food, perhaps from the TV dinner featured on the right, and text reading, one result of advertising is the neutralization of critical consciousness. Rejected because it is misleading and demeaning to a national public office, to the present holder of that office, and to the advertising industry. The posters that did receive a ticket to ride were displayed with the artist's name and Artemisia's phone number, leaving potential for feedback. The images accepted by the CTA tackled controversial issues addressed above, but they are much less confrontational in appearance and contact, content. Eight posters rode major local and express bus routes traversing the north and south sides of the city of Chicago, as well as the L. Sally Alitalo's placard juxtaposes a text comparing Greco-Roman and American-style wrestling superimposed with U.S. with a collage of men wrestling. What most observers would miss is the first line. The history of wrestling is so closely interwoven with the history of men and nations, creating a link with Parada's depiction of Smedley Butler and U.S. imperialism. A very playful triptych, yet a less confrontational take on sexism than Ravel's was Ilona Granite's Dear Men While on the Street, Maintain Eight Feet Distance, Thanks. And Turin's poster read Life Story. Funny, something significant happens. Time keeps passing. Below the text are six black and white photographs that trace significant moments in one's life, such as birth, marriage, and having children. And the photograph at the top of the slide is the only remaining documentation of the works installed on the CTL, CTA trains. This is by no means the first time artists have been censored by a public transit authority in the United States. In 1984, for example, the artist Michael LeBron tackled Reaganomics on the DC Metro with his poster, Tired of the Jelly Bean Republic, featuring President Reagan mocking unemployed workers and referencing the US leader's love of jelly beans and dismissal of the working class. And this was denied advertising space. Closer to Chicago, the Milwaukee-based group Mobilization for Survival attempted to purchase advertising space for a poster of a gun-toting President Reagan accompanied by the text, in this nuclear age, can we afford leaders who shoot from the hip? Milwaukee Public Transit first demanded that the peace group supply a $10,000 bond to protect the agency should any lawsuits be filed. With the exception of Ballard's representation of Reagan, the majority of the banned images and critical messages were mild-mannered compared to the cases in Washington, D.C. and Milwaukee, despite raising similar subjects. Rather, the images occupied a space between political agitation and pleasure and humor. CTA lawyers' insistence on censoring 10 of the artists was not just a reaction to critical messages, but part of a much longer history of suppressing feminist agendas. While negotiating the exhibition details with the Winston Network, the advertising arm of the CTA, the curators were unaware that the CTA was appealing a recent Illinois court ruling in August 1984 that declared its refusal to grant Planned Parenthood advertising space as unconstitutional, arguing further that the CTA's decision was based on a policy contrived, of contrived criteria for rejection. For this reason, the curators contended that the CTA lawyers were scrutinizing any advertising that might jeopardize their case against Planned Parenthood by exposing another by example of the CTA using feigned criteria. The ACLU already supporting Planned Parenthood's case began to investigate Artemisia's. And in July, 1985, the court ruled in favor of Planned Parenthood, but as David explains, 
She found it difficult to move forward with any lawsuit after the challenges of simply mounting critical messages. The commitment required to pursue, pursue a freedom of speech case clearly could be daunting to curators working on a volunteer basis and already holding jobs, not to mention trying to sustain their own artistic careers. The ACLU would soon find itself in another battle with the CTA in the city of Chicago in 1990, with Art Against AIDS on the road toward Chicago, Washington, DC, and San Francisco. It included Grand Fury's poster entitled Kissing Doesn't Kill. And the text at the bottom, corporate greed, government inaction, and public indifference had already been removed after the American Foundation for uh, AIDS, or AMFAR, felt it would provoke the public. Yet aldermen and Illinois state representatives still proposed a legislative ban. Eventually, the poster was installed, but almost immediately defaced, which you see on the lower left in the black and white photograph. Here, Chicago reflects the larger culture wars emerging under a conservative government in the US. After critical messages closed, the curators contributed documentation of it, the exhibit and its censorship to a few shows, including Uncensored, held at Spaces Gallery in Cleveland in 1987, and Inalienable Rights, Inalienable Wrongs, sponsored by the Committee for Artists' Rights, Chicago Artists Coalition, and the New Art Examiner in 1989. Yet, because they lost the collective experience of viewing these placards in public dialogue as David, Barron's, and Specter originally sought, the show remained an internal discussion limited primarily to artists, critics, and curators in Chicago, ultimately not meeting the definition of activist art shared at the beginning. Spectre contends in his catalog essay for critical messages that because of the show's existence outside literally of the usual spaces for exhibition, this art is free logically and financially from subservience to commercial inhibitions of the art support system. Yet the promise of the public domain proved to be a site of silencing subversions rather than freedom of speech. The exhibition exposes a critical moment in the history of both alternative spaces and public art. Artemisia's entry into the realm of public art came just too late. It missed the experimental freedom of the 70s and early 80s before Reagan conservatism became entrenched and filtered into policies of arts funding. And then it landed right in the midst of the emerging culture wars across the United States, where experimental art increasingly was being censored by various government agencies. After critical messages closed, the Artemisia Fund remained committed to feminism and social justice, but shied away from major public art projects, thus illustrating how the political and economic forces of the city of Chicago could widen rather than close the gap between artists and the public. Now, Woman Made and Sapphire and Crystals will develop activist programming that finds a more direct connection to a range of communities in order to foster the dialogue that Artemisia sought to create with its posters riding the rails and buses across the city of Chicago. Founded in 1992 by Beata Menkowski and Kelly Henson, Woman Made shares a mission with Artemisia and Sapphire and Crystals to provide visibility for women artists, but it has a distinct governance model. First, it embraces a patriarchal structure of governance rather than a consensus-based approach at Artemisia. Henson and Minkowski, while students at Northern Illinois University, started the gallery to exhibit their own collaboratively made artwork for their senior show. Occupying a storefront in Ravenswood Manor, the space increasingly attracted passersby, so they applied for not-for-profit status after seven months. They adopted Woman Made as their logo, challenging the commonly used and gendered phrase Man Made. Henson then leaves and Minkowski works with Janet Walk and Michelle Kanata, pictured on the right to establish an advisory board for the gallery. They soon recruited artist members and coordinated juried exhibitions for women with modest entrance fees premised on the idea that the gallery would serve as a stepping stone for emerging women artists, as well as a site for networking. And here you see an invitation for the women for the show Women Do Women which also describes Woman Made as a gallery 
studio and cafe. In 2005, women made move to the Milwaukee Avenue corridor, occupying a two floor, 3000 square foot space. Minkowski became executive director and the board hired a gallery coordinator and assistant. The advisory board became responsible for all aspects of the gallery's maintenance and programming, obligated to make an annual donation and raise additional funds through public and private grants. Now there's some advantages to this model compared to Artemisia. There's not an overburdened membership in terms of time and finances. Membership means a modest annual fee versus a monthly fee and the need to maintain the gallery space. In addition, entrance fees for submissions to juried art exhibitions throughout the year help sustain the space. And funding supports the director, staff, and the advisory board helps establish goals and policy. Over the 30 year history of the gallery, Women Made has tackled many themes in their exhibitions. And just one brief example Riva Lehrer juried Bodies Two, exploring the experience of disability in contemporary art. She's recognized for her commitment to positioning what she calls the variant body into the visual arts. And you may have recently seen uh, Lehrer's memoir, Gollum Girl, which was published in 2020. Former gallery coordinator Ruby Torkelson explains that as the staff and board contemplated Woman Made's 20th anniversary, they realized that they needed to get away from tokenism or essentializing ethnic identity as the main pathway to diversity in exhibitions. Although the gallery consciously recruited a diverse range of jurors for shows, it did not result in diverse audiences. Rather, it consisted primarily of white participants. So Woman Made then took a step in its 20th year to open up a conversation about how to form a multifaceted community, asking what kinds of relationships needed to be established and participation building practices. Respondents to a focus group led by my own colleague, uh, the painter Laura Kina, whose painting is featured here, and online surveys revealed that the gallery needed to develop strong and sustained links with other arts and community organizations throughout the city of Chicago, especially in non-white communities, and then creating opportunities for artists living in those areas. During this period, Woman Made also revised its mission statement to include gender non-conforming artists. Note female identifying highlighted here rather than just female or woman artist is used. This willingness to reflect and reassess one's position regularly is very important to sustaining a feminist activist organization. This period of reflection led to 20 neighborhoods project in 2012. It connected 20 complementary community organizations with the theme self, home, community, and the city, asking women of varied backgrounds and generations to explore personal experiences and aspirations for their homes, families, neighborhoods, communities, and the city. They focused on a flexible workshop model so that it could be altered or modified based on a particular group's needs, whether differences in culture, ability, or if the content seemed irrelevant to their lives. The first phase identified artists who could help shape the curriculum and identify partner organizations where teaching would take place. And here you can see the range of organizations. Some are art related, but many provide housing or other modes of social support. They also span all parts of Chicago from Logan Square to Pilsen, from north to south and east to west. One teaching artist, along with an assistant, facilitated each workshop with three to 10 artists Artists were not necessarily professional. In fact, most had no prior experience. Community partners recruited participants and not woman made to ensure the gallery was not replicating its usually white majority audience. Participants focused on assemblages and collage drawn from found objects and personal possessions, which could inspire conversation and the creation of symbolic content. Photographs of the artists with their artwork reveals their pride and sense of accomplishment, also joy and pleasure in coming together to make art. 
As one teacher explained, making honest and powerful declarations about their own potential and fulfillment has become a great motivator for encouraging others to do the same. There is a sense of responsibility in helping other women find themselves emerging into their potential and fully embracing themselves in the process. One participant commented, what I've, really, what I've learned really is to wrap my head around the label of being an artist because I don't personally feel like an artist or what I do is artistic, but it's slowly starting to grow on me. Another teacher concluded, though we are not ignorant, we are often ignored. This is an oppressive system to resist. As such, our greatest potential lies in creating and sustaining community. The women agree that they are the ones raising family, they are the ones working to make a future for their children, and therefore they are the ones who must continue to form communities among themselves to support one another. Conversations also address how to forge stronger connections in each community and what, what role art could take. In meetings, they discussed what would make you feel safer? If you could travel anywhere in Chicago, where would you go? What do you like about the schools in your neighborhood? And what would you change? If you could put your artwork from this project anywhere in your neighborhood for others to see, where would you put it? They use post-its to document their process. Me gustaría conocer más a Chicago. I would like to know or more about Chicago. I would like to change the way my neighborhood runs. If the gang danger wouldn't stand on my corner or stand in front of people. If the police officers patrol the hood better than what they do now. I would change the nutrition program of my school. Others called for add more art, add conflict resolution classes to schools, art in windows, a lawn gallery where we make art in the yard, art in trees. This exercise demonstrates the importance of the imaginary to reconceptualize relationships to our immediate surroundings and communities. And they remain valuable questions to consider today. After producing a series of collages, the workshops culminated with focus groups that debated how to curate the final exhibition and find ways to continue fostering dialogue after the exhibition ended. A very successful project overall, but faced a major dilemma for most feminist activist art. How do you sustain it? The project required the attention of all the staff plus volunteers it delayed exhibitions that generated income for the gallery. The, there was difficulty to find continued funding despite initial support from the Department of Cultural Affairs. And so the program could not continue through Woman Made. Today, Woman Made continues to work on diversifying its community. It's located in Pilsen. It has 330 member artists, but acknowledges that it still has work to do. Despite the fact that they could not continue the project, the need, the recognition of the need to reassess and to reflect on one's work, again, is essential to any feminist activist organization. Okay, and I'm gonna turn to the last group I wanna talk about, but I, I neglected to properly say at the beginning, if you have any comments or questions, please put them into the chat and I'm happy to answer them when I come to the, the conclusion. The last group I want to introduce is Sapphire and Crystals. As a collective of Black women artists, they do not necessarily describe themselves as feminists, given its connection or association with white feminism of the 70s, which ignored questions of race, ethnicity, and class, et cetera. But we can argue that the group reflects Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectional feminism, where voices experiencing concurrent forms of oppression are centered. Sapphire and Crystal's dynamic network of Black women artists began with a simple question. When Marva Pitchford Jolly, shown on the left, co-founder of the collective, with Felicia Grant Preston, shown on the right, who and where were other Black women visual artists? After a momentary pause, they were able to name only seven artists, and they were both included in the count. 
They decided to invite a group to discuss the possibility of an exhibition, which resulted in their first show entitled An Exhibition of Black Female Artists in the Chicago Area, held at the Southside Community Arts Center. The success of this 1987 exhibition prompted the group to formally organize as a collective. And 35 years later, Sapphire and Crystals continues to thrive. Comprised of a group of between 14 and 20 Black women artists at any one time, the group recognizes that art production often comes second to their full-time jobs. And that living in the Midwest means garnering less attention from the art market than their peers in New York or Los Angeles. The name Sapphire and Crystals pays homage to strong black women, as well as the growing spiritual consciousness of Jolly and Grant Preston during the late 1980s. Joyce Owens notes that crystals also suggest precious or hidden gems, highlighting the talented black female artists who have been overlooked for too long. Rose Blauen adds that Sapphire references the stereotyped character of the pushy black woman from the old Amos and Andy radio and television show, explaining that the group reclaimed Sapphire as an empowered woman who stood up for herself and crafted her own destiny, ideas which were consonant with our objectives as artists. New York-based painter Emma Amos's words from 1982 would likely resonate with Sapphire and Crystal's members at the time of their formation. Don't complain about being a Black woman artist in the 1980s. Many people, both Black and white, think you were fashioned to fit the slot in a turnstile, a mere token baby. Instead, Amos advocates, do exhibit with people whose work you like and in which you find similarities to your own. Your peers are the people who, you, who see your work as it's happening. They give you feedback and keep you going. Unlike other women's artists collectives we've discussed so far, Sapphire and Crystals chooses not to operate a physical gallery space and frees members to focus on developing their professional careers and mentoring one another. Relief from monthly membership fees and the obligation of maintaining a gallery, excuse me, also allows Sapphire and Crystals to remain active in the in community, excuse me, community-based art projects and programs, which frequently support underserved populations in Chicago. So Sapphire and Crystals has shown their art at a variety of institutions, including Artemisia in 1992 and Woman Made in 2012 for their 25th anniversary, which gave the group an opportunity to show their art to predominantly white communities with neglected histories of black artists. They also show frequently at universities and colleges so they can engage directly with students. It's also important for the group to foster increased interaction with the Black Arts Movement, so they regularly stage exhibitions at the Southside Community Arts Center in Bronzeville where they had their first show, and it's one of the oldest centers devoted to cultivating Black artists in the United States. Grant Preston explains that the members of Sapphire and Crystals have joined the group at very different stages of their careers and possess varied levels of professional experience. When she founded Sapphire and Crystals with Jolly, for example, Grant Preston's experience at the time involved mainly exhibiting in student shows and local art fairs. Sapphire and Crystals decided with their first show that the essential tasks would be equally distributed despite experience, including taking meeting notes, managing the budget, overseeing the production of catalogs, press releases and invitations, proofing and editing artist statements, and curating and installing the show. Possibilities for mentorship arise in these situations, group critiques and preparation for exhibitions, listening to each other, encouraging experimentation, and introducing members to artistic networks to help secure commercial gallery representation and sales. For Makeba Kadem DuBose, her experience with Sapphire and Crystals countered her grandmother's earlier warning 
that there was no room for a black female artist in the world we live in. And here you see um, an example from her COVID series from 2020. So for the last part of my talk, I wanna to turn to just one example of how Sapphire and Crystal supports its own communities, especially children. The Art of Flocking Summer Program in 2018 connected students to the work of Chicago artists with deep connect commitments to social justice, cultural preservation, community solidarity, and structural transformation. Sponsored by the Chicago Park District and the Terra Foundation for American Art, designed for children from the ages of three through 14 and held at city parks on the city's north, west, and south sides. Sapphire and Crystal's member Juarez Hawkins, who also served as a teaching artist for 20 neighborhoods, was among the teaching artists who designed the Art of Flocking curriculum to cultivate Black and Latinx children's understanding of their own cultural lineage and ancestry, and to explore questions of migration and immigration, resistance and healing, and personal and structural transformation. The curriculum featured exercises that were directly informed by the artists of Sapphire and Crystals and other Chicago-based creators. The module Remembrance was inspired by the work of founder Marva Lee Pitchford Jolly and the altars created by Sapphire and Crystals as a way for children to consider who their ancestors are and what family histories they honor. And the example I'm showing is one of Jolly's, one of three works by Jolly and DePaul um, in the DePaul Art Museum collection. And Jolly saw working in clay as a means to connect with her own history growing up in Crenshaw, Mississippi. And she talks about playing with mud and the creativity that came from that, but also the materiality of the earth being connected to her own family and legacy. Sapphire and Crystals honors deceased members and elders with altar installations in their exhibitions, a tradition that started after the passing of original members Venus Blue and Renee Townsend in 1997. For each altar, members display works they own by the deceased artist alongside a photograph and sets them against draped fabric. The installations also include candles, vessels, and other related ephemera, as often found in the altars of the Yoruba and ofrendas created for the Day of the Dead in Mexican communities. Blauen stresses that the altars are intended to establish a sacred space for their art that reflects and enhances the spirituality of their work. In December 2009, the collective installed this altar for original member Anna M. Tyler, who died that November. The fluid existence migration section contemplated parallels between bird migration and depictions of memory and heritage in the art of Joyce Owens and other artists. Owens painting revealed truths and myths. Number seven adds black faces to Italian Renaissance portraits and asks viewers to move beyond Eurocentric histories of painting to embrace difference by seeing through our shared common historical bond of slavery. The module Transformation Through Power Objects examined how children transform themselves by creating tools made from found materials and recycled objects after considering the work of Rhonda Wheatley and others. Wheatley's installation shown here was created for an exhibition inspired by Richard Wright's 1958 novel, The Long Dream, and provides shamanic tools for healing from the effects of the global pandemic and racial inequity. And here, I just wanna consider the impact of the curriculum. Art Seed teaching artist Ossosenia Martinez explains that art classes and schools in Chicago generally promote European artists as artistic models, such as Picasso and Van Gogh. You don't always get the opportunity to learn about Chicago-based artists, especially people of color. Maria Ambries, a fellow teaching artist, emphasized how the program taught students that art could be a tool for community transformation, undermining the frequent feeling that we don't have control in our own surroundings. The youth enrolled in the summer program also benefited from one-on-one -on -one conversations with several members of the collective. Participant, participant Jocelyn Kana stated, all these artists I met inspired me to do more art and to be something I couldn't imagine I would be. 
and she cited talking with Arlene Turner Crawford, shown in the center in one of her paintings on the left, as empower in particular as empowering her to continue her pursuit of life as an artist. When Turner Crawford was in third grade, she had a similar encounter with Dr. Margaret Burroughs, shown on the right. Burroughs helped establish the Southside Community Arts Center referenced earlier and co-founded the DuSable Museum of African American History and mentored generations of young artists in the city of Chicago. Burroughs asked Turner Crawford, oh, you like art? And then advised, start seeing yourself doing it. Start dreaming about it. Start visualizing yourself doing it. The activist Adrienne Marie Brown argues an emergent strategy, shaping change, changing worlds, what we practice at the small scale sets the pattern for the whole system. So we cannot underestimate these minor gestures and connections. The dedication to black and brown children and the generation who will carry this history forward reflects Sapphire and Crystal's connections to the black arts movement in Chicago since the 1960s. Committed to using art to communicate positive and powerful representations for African Americans. For example, Afrocobra or the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists. And this is just one of their exhibition posters. And public murals such as the Wall of Respect from 1967, celebrating Black heroes, involving the community living at 43rd and Langley in Chicago to influence the design. Juarez Hawkins, who helped design the Art of Flocking curriculum, lived across the street. Her mother Florence contributed one of the panels and her brother gave tours of the wall as a kid. Teaching the next generation means bringing black history to life and offering the career of an artist as a viable and important role to kids who do not necessarily have access to this encouragement in public schools in Chicago. Often visual art, music and theater programs are the first to be canceled. The impact of Sapphire and Crystal's art of flocking is clear, but like Woman Made is difficult to sustain. As shown as the slide and referenced earlier, the project was run through the Chicago Park District with funding from Art Design Chicago Initiative of the Terra Foundation to promote histories of Chicago's art and the Driehaus Foundation. So solid infrastructure, financial infrastructure is needed to continue these projects. So to sum up, while Artemisia Woman Made and Sapphire and Crystals are very different organizations. They share a commitment to alternative art structures that stake a claim that everyone should have access to art and given the opportunity to see themselves as an artist and to engage in important dialogues, whether politics or fostering community connections. Even though their activist projects were not always realized according to their original vision or could be sustained, all three collectives embody feminist activist ideals. By staging interventions in Chicago's communities to make a discernible difference in their lives, especially for women and children who are not fully supported by the art world or educational institutions in this city. The fact that all three groups have persisted for so long demonstrates how much more work is needed to be done. Sapphire and Crystals and Women Made revealed that there can be positive and meaningful collaborations with the city in comparison to the 1980s where contesting the status quo or offering alternative histories was seen as more of a threat. Women Made also reminds us that any feminist organization needs to keep reassessing its mission and goals in order to evolve and be more responsive to the communities they want to serve. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm very happy to take comments and any questions. And let me stop sharing here. Dr. Joanna, thank you so, so much for this. This was an amazing webinar. This is a lot of information. And um, I'm sure everybody on here learned a lot today. Um, we did have a question pop up in the chat. And I believe this was around the time when you were um talking about Amos and Andy television show possibly and um someone wanted to know which of these galleries still exist yeah that's a great question so Woman Made is still going it's in Pilsen so you can visit and Sapphire and Crystals is still going as well um they will be having an exhibition in the summer I'm not sure where yet um but there's also going to be a documentary released 
um, about their work, which is exciting, by a director named David Weathersby, who's done a lot of documentaries in Chicago. And then um, ARC Gallery, which I didn't talk about, still exists as well. And it's in, uh, um, I believe it's located close to kind of um, the Milwaukee corridor kind of in, in, in that area. So that's still going. And I guess that's close to 50 years. It'll be 50 years soon. So long time running. Um, and another question, are there any, is there anything upcoming that we should be on the lookout for that's not out? Do you have any insight? No, that's another great question. I would say the Sapphire and Crystals exhibition in the summer, just keep a, an eye out on um, a post for July um, will be a wonderful show because they're a really dynamic group of artists and just an amazing array of work. Um, they've done a lot of public artwork. Um, they did a lot of work during COVID. So one of the artists, and I'm embarrassed that I'm blanking out the name, did various kinds of billboards. So I'd say that's definitely something to look out for. And um, trying to think of what else is coming up in the summer, in the spring, in the summer. The Cultural Center always has really good shows and the MCA, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't think of anything else right now. Get a little bit in the zone of, <laughs> of the subject matter. Feel free to email me and I'll, I'll happily make recommendations. No problem, totally fine. Um, I just wanted to thank you again for such an amazing presentation. I also want to thank all of our alumni who joined us this evening. And again, this um, is recorded, so we will um, have this available within the next few weeks. So with that being said, thanks again. I hope everyone have a great rest of your evening, and I look forward to seeing you all in a future event. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>